Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to episode 41 of GBR. It's Thanksgiving week here in the United States and maybe other places in the world. And I'll have a few words on that in just a moment. But we do have a great show for you today. And our special guest is John Haber, who's been running Alto Music in New York State for what seems like forever, but it's definitely more than three decades. Even though the title says three, it's really more than three. I mean, we're not lying about it. It's definitely three, but in reality, it's it's probably a bit longer. And it's another opportunity for us to look at the retail side of the music business. Although, as you'll find out, John has interests in other ventures besides his chain of retail stores, but it's all related in one way or another. So we'll get to that almost immediately. Now, like I said, for many of you, it's Thanksgiving week. But even if you don't celebrate this holiday, the theme is certainly universal. It's about being thankful for what we have and all the good there is in our lives. It's not that there's not plenty of not so good to go around. There is. But I always believe that you have to focus on the power of the positive to replace the negative. And some of you may have heard me talk about that analogy of the pail of dirty water where, you know, you put the hose in the pail and, and turn it on. And eventually the pail is full of clean water. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And by the way, I really hope that this is not interpreted by anyone as something sinister. I mean, you never know these days, but it's just about the power of the positive to replace the negative. And really, it does work. In fact, I would suggest that you immediately after listening to our show today, grab a pail and fill it full of dirty water. Then grab a hose and do this experiment to prove it to yourself. Now, I know it could get messy and might cause a problem if you do this on a balcony of an apartment, but you can also do this in your kitchen sink using a small container. It will probably work just as well. Send me an email. Let me know the results and snap a few pictures if you like. We might even share them. But obviously, we've uh, gotten off on a bit of a tangent here, so I'm afraid with that, it's time for something completely different. Well, John Haber refers to himself in his email signature as the Grand Poobah of Alto Music, you know, the well-known chain of music stores that he's been running since the late 80s. But what's in a title anyway? He's the main guy. And I had a chance to sit down with him a few days ago, virtually, of course. And we talked about a lot of stuff that I think you're going to find really interesting. So let's just get to it as John Haber joins us right here and right now. Hey, John, thanks so much for coming on the show with us today, and welcome to GBR. Hey, hi, Jeff. Good morning. It's uh, great to be with you. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Very early here on the on the West Coast, but uh, nothing wrong with getting started sure. early and just have enough coffee to, to keep going here. So, you know, to get briefly into what we call those foundational aspects, um, we always like to find out a little bit uh, about some of the things in your early life that uh, helped you get where you are today. And so I was wondering what you could tell us about that part. Well, music, I've been uh, I've been playing the guitar since I'm six years old, actually. Wow. Uh, <laughs> my mom had a old classical in the house that I never really paid much attention to. But I remember being out in the street playing uh, like wiffle ball with some kid who was, I don't know, maybe three or four years older than me. He started uh, he was talking about the Beatles, which I never heard of. I actually missed I'm a little too young to remember them while they were still playing. So I came home to my mother and she's like, uh, you ever hear the Beatles? <laughs> oh, she goes, yeah, my mom had three albums. She had Meet the Beatles, she had Sgt. Pepper, and she had Let It Be. Wow. And uh, I put on Meet the Beatles, and my that that was, you know, everything I've done in life can go back to that single moment. That, that hit me like a ton of bricks. So from that point on, I uh, I would play that record every day, nonstop. I mean, just the energy, even if you listen to that record today, the energy that emanates from that music is just off the hook. They were such a great band. So I started playing guitar because my mom had the guitar. Uh, I took lessons from a lady in the neighborhood. 
And the lady in the neighborhood, she wasn't much of like a rock player. She was into folk music, but she was really good at um, like finger picking. That was her specialty. So I learned all these strums. So like my whole, you know, all this like flamenco type stuff. Sure. And, yeah. You know, um, like you would. Uh, so. I, and to this day, that definitely I have that in me still from her. Um, it's not what I wanted to learn at the time, but uh, it definitely gave me like that sense of rhythm and a different way of looking at it, as opposed to just getting a pick and playing bar chords, you know, right, um, right. power chords or whatever. So I was playing. I always I started putting to grab whoever I could to be, you know, play music with me from a young age, even if they couldn't play. I had kids in school that I always used to in class. It's, I would always get together and try to you know, get a band going with them. I and I've been going and since I'm like in third grade, I've been like, you know, with that. And then um, I was lucky enough growing up in the neighborhood where I grew up, where the, uh, the wiffle ball game kid told me about the Beatles. And then I took lessons from this lady down the block. There happened to be two rock bands that rehearsed in my neighborhood by the time until I got up, maybe when I was like 10. Oh my. Nice. And one of them was next door to my house. And the other one was like down the block. But if I was like watching TV Seven, seven on a Sunday night or something at seven o'clock, I could feel the ground rumbling yeah. from the base next door. So I used to sneak out of the house and every time they practiced, I was always that annoying kid, you know, hanging around. Um, and, they, and there was another band down the road who was uh, actually the brothers were in both bands. And uh, I, whenever I could, I'd go down there too. And that's how I learned really like I would nick riffs off these guys. I mean, these guys were, this is like 1975, mm -hmm. maybe six and I got exposed to a lot of, you know, really cool things from uh, listening to those guys play. I learned how to do all these cool riffs that you would never really learn. There was no like tablature back then. There was no books you could buy uh, that would show you how to play a solo. There was always plenty of books with chords in there, mm -hmm. but there was no YouTube. You know, it was very hard to figure this stuff out. And, it, you know, those guys would spend their time. I guess I was annoying enough to get their attention and they would show me all these things. And, uh, that was a big factor in just my musical, you know, life. And then I used to hang out after the guys would sit me in the van and be uh -huh. these little Miller, Miller lights, these little eight ounce Millers. And the guy would go, Hey, you ever hear this? You ever hear that? And put on <laughs> Rainbow and he put on like Angel and all these bands that, you know, I'd never heard of. And I'm asked, you know, it's really I have very fond memories of the day. Did they and ever, I, uh, ask you to sit in. <laughs> I, I was just going to go. So when I was like 11 or 12 years old, the guitar player next door did not show up. Mm. I played with them. It was awesome. That was, I mean, these guys had like massive, the guy had a bass player had, the company had this big earth stack, like with white foam around the whole thing. It was <laughs> my, I think it was like six feet tall or whatever, however tall it was big, as big as I was or bigger. And then, uh, <laughs> They had, you know, and they were in a tiny, you know, like in a high ranch house, half of a garage cut off with the drums on a riser and these massive, and it was so loud. <laughs> it was, yeah, that was an awesome experience. And you were, uh, what, 12 years old or something like that? Something like that, 11 years, something like that. But I knew all the songs by that point. Wow. Uh, I used to, you know, I had the guy from the band next door come over one time when I had like a half day of school and he showed me like all these Jimmy Page riffs. This guy was like so gifted at figuring out soloing you know and i convinced him to come over he left his les paul in my house for like a week when he left oh nice <laughs> and you didn't play it at all did you oh i got non-stop i played it <laughs> the guy was like changed i was like 12 years old maybe the guy was chain smoking the whole time my mom came home from work the whole house smells like cigarettes oh boy and she said i don't know she was cool <laughs> it wasn't me but I, yeah the les paul was great living at the house i had a 30 dollar electric guitar at the time that i met i mowed lawns one summer to save that Thirty dollars that bought this used electric guitar. I think it came from Sam Goody, the oh. guy down the street. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And a funny story to tie into that. My, I begged my father. I didn't never had an amplifier. I literally had that electric guitar for a couple of years. I had no amp. Yeah. But the son of the lady I took lessons to from, she had like a telephone. It was like a record player. I don't know. This thing must have been from the late '60s. It had an input jack on it, so you actually could take an electric guitar and plug into it and. It sounded pretty good. You know, you were able to like, you know, amplify the signal. That's what I used to go over there whenever I wanted to hear myself amplified. And uh, I finally got a Fender Vibro Champ. I think maybe I was like 12 or something like that. And just like a month ago, a guy who I'm friends with on Facebook reached out to me. He goes, you know, I have your original amp. No way. And, yeah, I go, he goes, you sold it to me for like $30 back. <laughs> 
And now it's now it's worth how much, John? <laughs> um, an app like that, a perfect dish is worth about six hundred bucks. Um, but I got the amp back. Oh just, no, really? Oh. Yeah, I just got it back, and uh, I had my tech here like soup it up. That thing sounds unbelievable. I just I'm recording a new record with my band, and I actually use that for the last song. I used uh, one of the tracks, so I played through that amp. That's very uh, cool. Very cool. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was a really uh, that was great. It's great to have back. So you did, you, uh, you're probably almost, uh, you're into high school and I would imagine is, did, 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 I assume this continued now through your schooling, right? Oh yeah. I was in bands the whole, you know, in junior high school, all through junior high school, I played a uh, jazz band. My parents, you know, gave me lessons and I had, uh, so I knew, uh, some theory, I knew how to read music, which the other guys in the neighborhood that were older than me, who I used to, you know, cop the wrist on I didn't think, I don't think they could do any of this stuff. So I did have like a foundation in theory um, reading music. And so I played in the jazz band throughout high school and junior high school. I was in, uh, rock bands, you know, throughout that whole time. And I used to shop at, uh, my, my local store was uh, Alto music. So yeah. I bought, um, my, I had a Yamaha acoustic. My parents bought me when I was in fourth grade. And, um, when I got my, that Vibro champ, uh, came from there and I started taking classical guitar lessons. I think when I was 15, uh, I would, I always liked the way that sounded. So I was going in on a Friday. I used to ask, I asked for a job at Alto. At, at, at 15, right? Yeah, 15, yeah. Uh, maybe just turning 16. And then one, one, it was a Friday night. I used to take guitar lessons, the classical lessons, maybe at like 6.30. Mm -hmm. And the guy, Harvey, who uh, was the owner's son, who was you know, one of the owners there, uh, he said to me, kid, you, you still need a job? I must have asked like a bunch of times. And I go, yeah. And then uh, that's how I got my career into music retail from that day. So you, never, you started in about what, 16 or so. Is that right? I must, have, I must have just turned 16 because I remember the driver's education classes that I used to take Saturday mornings would drop me off there after, after the class. So yeah, I was 50, I, was, I must've got when I was 15. I was just turning 16. So you're, um, and we're going to talk a lot about Alto, obviously, because you, you know, your story really revolves around that. Not that there isn't a whole bunch of other stuff, but since you got started there, um, really early, you've now been there and involved there three decades or more, whatever, much more than that, I guess now. Um, Oh, I'm four of them. Yeah, yeah. Or if you count from when, when you, uh, but you know, I want to, I want to jump ahead just a little bit. I mean, you can fill in any blanks that you want. I want to understand how you acquired your proprietary interest uh, in the business, and and then uh, you know, going on from there, you know, what uh, you might have been just either amazed by or surprised by, you know, in those first few years when you were still kind of getting into it. So it's maybe it's kind of a two parter, you know, however you want to do. Yeah, it. yeah. So I mean, so so I'm starting now. I'm 15, 16 years old. So it's nineteen eighty one. Um, I'm working in this small shop. That's really my first job. Ever. It's the first job I ever had, right? That I, you know, pay taxes and, you know, you want to get a paycheck every day. Sure. So I was there when all the synthesizer boom started. Mm. All the cassette four tracks were just starting to come out. And um, I was responsible for getting into that store, um, like when the Korg M1 came out mm -hmm. and the Sonics, the VFXs and the EPSs and, uh, I was a monster salesman. I mean, I was on that floor and I sold $2,000 plus keyboards every single day I was there, many times multiple. I mean, it was like such a, like, cause you know, you're showing to the customer coming in at that time, it was like this stuff landed from outer space, right? The fact that I could hit a key and somebody's voice would start talking. Now, did you, uh, did you play keyboard at all or? Yeah, I took piano lessons as a kid. I still play yeah. a bit. You know, yeah. Yeah. So you could, you could sort of demo the product without any, any problem. I would imagine. No problem. I learned how to use all the sequencers. I learned how to, you know, the stuff quantizing and whatever you need to learn how to do to create something that sounds cool. And, uh, that was pretty awesome. So, I mean, we just, so I knew I had a knack for the business for selling things. Right. So, I mean, I, I sold a lot of stuff down there. So, um, in, uh, my, in 1989, I opened my own store. So my uncle was always telling me my uncle, um, my mother's brother is a very successful businessman. He, um, made, uh, men's shoes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, in Italy. 
Uh, so like, and so like all the name brands that were sold in the U S at that time, he like designed them and made them. And these brand names were just stamped there. Nice. Um, and he was, you know, I was very close with him and he, uh, is the one, you know, open your own store by this time I'm 20, 23 ish. And then, uh, he going, you open your own store. One day he like off, he goes, I'll loan you the money. He's offhanded. We said that one time we were at dinner. And then like a year later, I said, you know what? I actually, I got the idea to open my own store. I was getting a little tired of uh, playing in the band. I really, I wanted to make money. Yeah. Um, and I knew I was really good at selling stuff. So like, I go, how hard can, uh, how hard can this be, right? To open your own business. You know, hmm. I didn't know anything. Yeah. I knew nothing. I never took a business course in college. I did, I did finish college with a history degree. So I, uh, even though I was playing in a band all the time, somehow I got through that in four years. Well, you could always teach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which both of my parents are teachers, by the way. Yeah, there you go. Um, so um, it's 1989. I go to my uncle. You know what? I decided to open that store. And um, he loaned me the money. Well, so, was, yeah, then r- kind of run me through where the part that I wanted to know was uh, the interaction with, uh, because it was, you were still involved with the other guys or what? Yeah. So um, I, my boss, Harvey, at the time, I go, Harvey, I'm opening my own store. I'm doing it. You know, you, you want to go in as partners. And uh, he said, yes. You know, later on, he tells me that he would, they were scared of me uh, competing against them. That's why everyone was telling them not to take me in. They're like, why would you do that? Um, you know, but I was bringing something to the table. I had the money to put in and, uh, they didn't want to compete against me. This is what Harvey and his wife still tell me to this day. Uh, so he went in on it. And, uh, so I opened my first store in 1989, November, uh, right in the, uh, the we country. We were in a recession at the time. I had a small 2,100 square foot store. No, um, that's a good start. Yeah, it was something. Um, so I opened like November 10th. Was that in a, diff- a different city, John? Uh, from- oh, that's in Middletown. It was in Middletown, New York, in Orange County. It's about 40 minutes north of where the original location was that I worked at. Yeah, I'm in the other Orange County. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you're, in the nicer, you're in the nicer one. Yeah. Um, so I o- we opened the store, and I did like from like November 10th to the end of the year, I think we did like $150,000 worth of business, and that, which is a lot of business. I had me and two other people working. That's it. Again, I knew nothing. I mean, I don't think I ever, you know, yeah, maybe I did a bank deposit, but that was about it. I didn't know how to really fixture a store. The store that I came from was kind of a, to be polite, you know, not that aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> so, and honestly, I learned a lot of things that I shouldn't do. Yeah. So I knew at the time. Well, that's how we learn. <laughs> exactly. So, um, I didn't even know what like slat wall was or any of this crap. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just kind of threw up stuff, but I sold a lot of stuff and we had a great business from day one. I mean, it was really, uh, now how far, how far away was that store from the original store? About 40 minutes. Okay. 40 minutes. So you had some separation there. So, so geographically it wasn't probably a real big problem, was it? No, but I, I knew from the original store that people would travel down from Orange County a lot. Mm -hmm. There were small stores and shops in Orange County, but nothing that carried anything technical or in, um, or had a great selection of guitars and things like that. So, um, I said, Hey, this is probably a good spot to open. And I was right. I mean, I turned out to be, uh, Turned out to be a well, tell, tell me a little bit about the inventory that you were able to uh, uh, develop and and say that first year. What were you able to get in there? So I took as much. So I put cash into the business. Um, I don't mind telling you, it's a hundred. I put a, my uncle loaned me one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. OK, that's now, pretty 19, good. Yeah. Okay. 1989, one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. You know, that was something. It's a lot more than it's worth now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and. So and I, the deal was that this, uh, I went partners um, with Harvey and he put up that much in inventory. Oh, okay. so, got so, it. So, oh, but not day one. So whenever I would need product, I would just go to the original store and drive it up every morning. And I remember we uh, filled up my buddy's landscape truck for the initial big load in. And we just loaded it up with inventory, drove it up, you know, next to the weed whacker. Yeah. Unloaded it. And uh, so if somebody needed a Fender guitar and Sunburst, then the other store had it. It would be there the next day. And that's how I kind of. Now, you said you didn't have too much of a background in business, but obviously you had to figure out how to keep track of all that stuff and make sure that uh, 
that the it, partner it, arrangement would work okay? Yeah, the, I mean, my partner arrangement worked okay. He's, he's the nicest guy. It's, he, let, he let me do. He trusted me enough to let me do do what I wanted to do. I had kept everything on index cards, so you get like a uh, black Les Paul custom in. When they get they come into the store, we would write the serial number on the card. Everyone that came in, as soon as they were sold, you put a line through the serial number and you put the date. I had that system roll until the year 2000, by the way. And I got, until I went into my latest building and it worked. Assuming someone didn't take the inventory, the index cards for that brand home with them at night. That yeah. was, was the biggest problem. So anyway, uh, that's how it, that's how it started and, uh, built from there. Well, um, it's just, I love this story. Um, you know, there's a long history. So now I'm kind of wondering as we, as we move forward, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, some of the most substantial, I guess, milestones for alto music. And then, uh, you know, maybe something about the challenges as well, because I think our listeners are, are always interested in that stuff. And we always learn from those things. Everybody learns. So uh, I'm going to give it back to you and, and let you run with it and give us a sense of what happened and so again as i said i had no real business experience certainly not operating a business but i knew i had common sense enough that i better get more money sell it for more money than i paid for you know <laughs> that was like the extent of my knowledge but you know and I, and I and i and again as i said earlier i can sell things and uh you know i was also you know i'm also i was lucky in a certain extent you know uh, luck was on my side i was in a I was in a area I came to that really had, we didn't have great competition. I mean, they, they were all one by one would fall off the map. One of the harder things I did, I, so in 1992, I opened another store in across the river uh, um, in Dutchess County, which is uh, near Poughkeepsie, the stores in Wabajas Falls. So the, um, the one thing I didn't have when I opened my store in Orange County was the Fender franchise because there was another guy in town who had that. Got it. And back then, franchises actually meant something. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> topic. Uh, yeah. So it was a store that was a very known store in that county, in Dutchess County, um, that was going out of business. It was Rainbow Music. Um, they were there for a while. And uh, so I knew I would get Fender if I opened that Fender came to me. So I opened the store there. Now, again, I'm only a guy who's maybe two and a half years into having his own store and now opening a second one. And that was tough. Mm. That was that was a real learning experience because it's hard enough to get one business rocking around. But once you start going to multiple locations, that's really a whole nother skill set. And I certainly did not have it. You know, I misjudged on some of the manage, managerial you know, managers that I picked to help. Um, it took me a couple of years to get that on, you know, eating key. That's, that's never easy. That's never easy. Yeah. It takes a while to sort of get the hang to, you know, to be able to read people and to, you know, to at least get to the point where you've got some intuition that uh, you can see red flags and things like that. But uh, exactly. It takes a while. exactly. Yeah. Um, managing the inventory now, now everything's double, yeah. you know, the, the cash flow, the money. That was yeah, just the whole, just the logistics of doing. That's why my hats are off to like places like Sam Ash, uh, who you know they got forty some odd fifty stores and having you know really just everything set in place. It's not an easy thing to pull off, and they're pretty. You know, that always impressed. I only have a few, and it's, it's challenging. So and, uh, and the and the personnel really gets to be important. To that's key. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I have the people that are in that store, my main store. I, they've been with me many of them for decades now. You know, I got my number the guy behind me here in my main location. Is, I think I hired him when he was 16. He's 35 now, I believe. He's and he's he's been here for a while. And I got a lot of guys that have been here decades. You know, 15 years, 20 years. So um, I'm very fortunate. I try to make it a fun place. And, uh, Makes a huge difference. Yes, it does. But those are the challenges. But uh, having a second location was really, uh, you know, challenging. Um, it's also challenging with, uh, you know, dealing with all the, we deal with so many manufacturers and, you know, the changing of, you know, the guards at these companies sometimes throws things into, uh, it's very, it's really, we're, we're relationship driven business, I think. So it's people that, you know, once that's so important. The try, you know, having a relationship with who you're dealing with. Yeah, let me let me just uh, interject, and maybe we'll, you know, we'll cover uh, some of the more current things in a second. But uh, one of the things that I I love to ask CEOs is uh, is how they would describe their own management style and uh, and what effect that has on your company culture. Uh, how do you see yourself in that regard? I'm very hands on. Um, I'm actively involved. 
in a lot of things in a business. Maybe I'm, you know, one thing I'm working on is to, you know, doing less things, you know, whatever I can figure out that someone else can do that I was doing. I'm trying to like get, you know, not really delegating. I was delegating things, but it's uh, to have a more broader view. Um, I'm very hands-on though, and I work hard and I would never, there's not anybody in the store that I would ask to do something that I wouldn't do myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody here sees that. And I think I get respect from them because of that. I mean, I'll do whatever needs to be done. Uh, so the, uh, that's, uh, but they, uh, understand that you're giving them the responsibility though, right? To yes. Um, you know, people do purchasing, people are running the repair departments, people are in the service departments, the customer service. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I enjoy this. I mean, for the most part, <laughs> this is things I don't really enjoy that much, sure. but, but I, I come to work every day and I'm jazzed to be here. I have so much exciting things going on, you know, with Alto and with the other companies that I'm, that I have and dealing with people around the world. So it's, it's, it's challenging, but, um, keeps me busy. keeps me out of trouble. One related question. Uh, you have, you have three or four locations now. I'm trying to remember store locations. Yeah, we have three full line stores. Okay. Um, and a, we have a showroom recording showroom in uh, Brooklyn in the city that just caters to the recording. So community. you have these group of people. Are there any times when you, you know, you get all of your people from all the different, stores and establishments uh, together for anything? Is there any uh, camaraderie or cross-pollination yeah. going on there at all? That's um, that's a good question. Um, I used to have these big Christmas events every year. I did summer events every year. People get together. I haven't done it in the last couple of years. It's something I probably should do, and it's on my list. Um, they're in constant – everybody's in constant contact via Skype and uh, you know video conferencing all day long. Uh, we're all like – our computers are all interlinked with each other, and it's uh, – so we work together a lot, but yeah, you're right. Having them all come together more is something I probably should do. Yeah, let's, uh, you know, I read a lot uh, that, uh, you know, in the last few years about your your own musical work as a player again. And uh, so I was hoping you'd give us a little bit more about what you're doing in that regard. And then also, you know, how does that help you if it does uh, to stay connected with your business? So there's a couple elements to that as well. Yeah, I mean... Um, the music's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing, right? I mean, that's the, I, I mean, I love it. You know, that's what I'm doing. I've always been a songwriter and I've, you know, I get stuff done on, uh, you know, stuff used in TV shows and commercials, things like that. Uh, but it was never like a serious thing to do for, um, for money. So now um, the money angle of it, but it's something I really enjoy doing. And a few years ago, I um, put this project together and we put out a record. Um, I have a singer who actually manages the keyboard department at Alto. He's like the most gifted musician I've ever been around. I mean, a guy can sing like is amazing. His guitar playing is amazing. Drumming is is piano. He's really incredible. Um, so we've been working together um, musically since about 1997. He would wow. sing on the shows and stuff. Yeah. And so we put a record out, um, and uh, it was good. We got a lot of good reviews on it. And uh, is that the Deck Three? A band's called Deck Three. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we are about finishing up a second record right now. We got Steve Jordan playing drums, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, people don't know him; he's one of the most famous drummers out there. You know, a lot of people consider him you know, one of the best, you know, of all times in the top list. Um, and we got you know we're in these great studios. Chris Lord Algie's mixing it. We got Ted Jensen mastering it. So it really sounds great. And we're excited. We're just in the studio on Wednesday, actually finishing up the last two songs. So it was uh, that's been a lot of fun, and it does keep me. I mean, I'm in tune with what's happening by doing that. It certainly helps everything else I do by being in that environment. Product ideas. With my other companies, I, I developed products. And a lot of what I came up with was knowledge I've gained from, you know, still playing and being around people. Yeah, you know, it's um, when uh, I talked to uh, uh, Michael Cerevolo the other day from uh, Schechter, and one of the things that stood out in that interview that I commented in the uh, the back of the show segment was he kept referring to uh, being able to stand on the other side of the counter. And, uh, you know, and that's so important to, to be able to, you know, you can't you can't work in a vacuum. Uh, you got to be market driven a good share of the time. And uh, and certainly that's one way to do it, being part of it. Uh, do you are you playing? Do you do shows or anything like that? Or well, it... We've been asked a lot. Um the, first, the last record, you know, I was on TV. I did put a band together to play this stuff live. 
um, because uh, Fox wanted us to play live on one of their shows. I, I ended up being the only one, one that, uh, appearing on the television show. And there was a million people, you know, heard they premiered one of our songs uh, four years ago. So we don't play live. It's really a studio project. Mm-hmm. Could mm-hmm. we play live? I mean, probably. We need to practice a bit. Yeah. But. <laughs> it's, a, it's an effort. That's an effort. It's a whole different exactly. uh set of uh, logistics and yeah i'm into making records i mean you know just writing the songs really working on the lyrics getting that down is that's that's what i like the most are you are you selling any of the material at all or yeah we sell yeah we sold i don't know a couple thousand downloads Mm -hmm. of the songs off our first album Mm -hmm. and get used a few commercials things we used on tv shows had a couple placements on that, but I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it because I love doing of it. Of course. So, and and four years it, I would still do it. <laughs> that's the nice thing about it. I mean, I have played for ever since I was a kid, but I, I think in my twenties, I just decided that this is not going to be my career. And when you don't have to depend on it, um, it's a different story. When you have to depend on it, it's hard work <laughs> you know? and it's, and it doesn't always work most of the time. No, you're right. I mean, yeah, I feel, I mean, I love it. I mean, I, I basically, I, I write all the music. I produced all this stuff. Um, it all starts with like a click track and an acoustic guitar. And then what I can create with the guys, it's just very satisfying. It's a very satisfying thing to do. So let's have you put on your industry leader cap a little bit for a moment. And, uh, you know, give me some of your thoughts on the retail music industry uh, in terms of where you think it's going, both from the positive and maybe the not so positive view. Uh, love to hear what you think. Well, I think that, I mean, I like the initiatives that NAM is doing, um, trying to create more musicians. That's really the thing that we need the most. Um, there's a lot going on in the world and things that distract people than there were like when I was growing up. So we need more musicians. That's the thing. So, and I think the best thing, like whenever you had like an Eddie Van Halen come out or a Slash come out, you know, that really makes more people interested in playing an instrument. Yeah, you got to have heroes, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on from the industry. Some manufacturers are like starting to sell direct. That's an uh, issue. But, We've been hearing that too as well, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know really how well that'll end up in the long. That's a whole different skill set you need. Start dealing with the end user, you know, the whole customer service. Well, angle. it started really with small manufacturers and you know, that was really pretty much how they did it. Uh, I've been involved with lots of small builders for a long time. Uh, and uh, and now it seems to have creeped up so that, uh, you know, the bigger organizations, some bigger, uh, you know, are, are starting to do it, whether or not it's, it's a trend. I mean, every, everything has changed, especially in the last 10 or even five years, so much. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, so like, what, like, so like a company that sells direct, right? Why? What do they think they can do better than, say, a company like Sweetwater could do, right? Like, what do they bring into the party that some of the other leading retailers weren't weren't doing? I don't think anything. Uh, So, I mean, I I think something, um, the whole thing could torpedo. I just don't necessarily know if that's a long, like a real good idea for long term down the road. Maybe you get a little more margin up front. Um, yeah, that's probably I, the big the, the big thing they see, I would imagine. And then then in some cases, uh, a lot of them are not uh, well prepared to to deal with larger uh, and more demanding retailers who really want them to make sure they are you know putting out a product that they can sell and be confident with. And I imagine that's an issue that you have to deal with as well. I mean, it sounds like a short term corporate BS policies to me. I, I, I just don't get it. So like I've been around long enough. Not everybody's on top of the heap all the time, right? I'll use synthesizers as an example, right? You got the three big ones are Yamaha, Korg, and Roland. So if you look over the last 20 years, there's always, they all have their turns being on top, right? Mm-hmm. Like depending on what models come out, maybe Yamaha is the leader for three years and also Roland has a new thing. They, they seem to be, and then the Korg has it. So they, I've seen them constantly rotate. Not that they all don't do well all the time, but they, there's always one who stands out. So if one of those companies was selling direct. Uh-huh. And who do you think support? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So like some of the other companies in selling other products, you know, they may not always be on top 
all the time. You know, they, they may want that. They may need the support from the dealers when times maybe get a little tougher. That maybe they're sacrificing by doing what they're doing now. So yeah, let me, <laughs> let me ask you a little bit. The obvious big gorilla in the room, uh, the sort of the mashup between uh, you know brick and mortar and online business. Uh, <laughs> tell me a little bit about what you're doing with that and uh, how how you see that balancing out and and going forward. Yeah, well, we do, you know, we do both um, a local market. You know, a lot of people locally have found out about us from the online. You know, mm-hmm. I know you like, well, how is that possible? You know, if people, I don't know, I don't know people look at the phone book, I guess, if I'm not on TV, I, people just don't know. So we, we try to use our online business to either generate more people to come into the store. We always are very, uh, we want to encourage question asking for guys looking at a guitar that one of our guitar people in the store helps them directly. Uh, we try to have that kind of all working together. Um, but it is, it's, it's a, uh, selling online is tough. Like I think the whole, I hear people who don't do that much of it all. You know, online customer service, you know, sucks and, you know, in store we provide that's, that's total, that's total BS from where I'm coming from. The online almost requires more customer service and there's so many things that could go wrong. <laughs> You know, it's, it's a Murphy's so, paradise, basically. Yeah, I mean, think about it. I mean, the ship FedEx could lose the box, which they seem to be enjoying doing lately. I got a bunch of those going on. That stuff doesn't show up. It's damaged. It's you know, mm-hmm. it's, you know. So somebody walks in the store, they're actually holding the product. So, and generally speaking, you get way less returns from in-store sales. So you, you'd rather, I mean, you, you like the idea of using uh, the online business to really attract uh, in-store uh, business. Is that, would that be more of a preference for you or? Yeah. If, if given my choice, I'd make everything I'd sell in store. Why would I, if I had to sell a guitar on Amazon, it's a thousand dollar guitar. I'm just making up a number here. Amazon's grabbing 15%, right? Yeah. So that could probably cost me seven fifty. So now I'm only getting eight fifty. Then I got to ship it. Whoops, there's another thirty five dollars. Right now I'm only getting eight hundred fifteen bucks. I got to pay it out of box, and I got to pay the box. You know, I'm making like forty or fifty dollars on a thousand dollar guitar at the end of the day. That's like selling groceries. Yeah, it's well. <laughs> yeah, the only the only thing we have is it doesn't go bad, right? But typically, so yeah, I kind of why not have it? So if I can have someone come in the store and even give them five to ten percent off, I would make way more money. The customer's getting a deal. Like, why wouldn't I do that? So, yes, we encourage that. Well, you want to optimize the model that works works for you. And, I, you know, everybody's got to have some kind of online presence now. And But everybody, every company's different. And, uh, you know, you're not you're not doing what Sweetwater or any of those people are, are doing. And, you know. I, mean, I don't think anybody, uh, nobody can do what they're doing. Those guys are, that's, yeah. that's an amazing place, what's going on there. Yeah, and we, yeah, we talked to Phil Rich the other day. And, as you know, in a very interesting interview. So, uh, you know, I know that. Um, you're involved in, in several other related businesses, John. So uh, love to hear something about that and what you're doing. Sure. So I have a company. Um, I started Red Distribution. It was like 12 years ago. I would find these brands. It's all everything I do here is all in the recording you know, facet of the industry. Um, so I would find brands that whenever in the U.S. and work with them to develop products and bring it here in the U.S. So I have a distribution company that sells in U.S. and Canada to other retailers. Mm-hmm. Um, we do all the service here as well. And uh, since I started that company, I have two other companies now that manufacture products. Uh, one is Aventone. We make uh, studio monitors, microphones, headphones. Really? Really? Uh, yep. And, and, and where, uh, where do you mean? Is that manufacturer yeah. in USA or is that imported or what? They're made, that company's products are made in China. Mm-hmm. I have a team of three people in China uh, that, you know, oversee everything there. It comes to New York. We do the QC here. And depending on the product, certain microphones we go through, we swap out tubes, which uh, replace certain components. Oh. Uh, and that's all done in, in New York. And then my third company is um, Black Lion Audio. So we make more studio equipment, mic preamps. Uh, we make digital clocks that we have patents on um, and uh, compressors, things along that. That's And they're made in Chicago and here in New York. Ah, so it, it all kind of ties in, but it sounds like it kind of goes back to your interest in, uh, you know, in the recording side and, you know, in the, in the pro audio side, I guess, huh? Yeah, it's exactly. I mean, it's, um, it's all recording based equipment. Uh, that I distribute and uh, Red distributes about six other brands. And then we have Avantone and Black Lion and we use distributors around the world 
to sell our products. Now, do you you have uh, a retail uh, aspect there? I mean, are you selling to yourself and then uh, selling to Al- customers? Yeah, so we sell to all the other retailers in the, um, that there are. Alto is one of the customers. Yeah. Um, Alto actually pays more for the product than I would charge, say, somebody else. Of course. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, it must. I mean, to, this is a political tightrope that I work. You know, you know, you got to do this the right way, or don't do it. You can screw things up badly. So, and you know, through this, I became very good friends with you know other people in the industry that maybe I wouldn't have become you know friendly with, like the guys at Sweetwater, you know, just other other retailers that I'm at very good relationships. By working with them on these. Well, other that d- that diversity so is fun. has got to be good. It's got to be, uh, you know, give you a little. Uh, I don't know if you call it security, but I mean, if something one thing dips a little bit, you know, you've got other things that can kind of uh, jockey their way up uh, during. It also, allows, yeah, it also allows you to, you know, to be creative in a different manner than a retailer would be creative. Exactly. Uh, like you know, I come up with a lot of product ideas myself, and to see something come out, and it's pretty cool. It's a cool feeling. Well. Um, finally, uh, you look, you're, uh, still a reasonably young guy, probably, um, uh, just getting into middle age while I'm sort of, in, uh, sort of in the throes of, of, uh, middle age. That's the way I'm looking at it. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I, you know, I'd like to see what you see in the future for John Haber, where, what are kinds of, uh, aspirations, larger goals do you have and, and that you could share with us? I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Um, All my growth is like this organic thing. I don't really have these long-term big visions. I kind of try to seize opportunities when I see them and I just take them, but it's not this detailed plan I have. I'm still happy doing what I'm doing and uh, plan to keep doing it. Well, (laughs) yeah, we're all doing that. Well, well, you've had a a great career so far. You got a long way to go and lots of fun stuff. And I know we're going to have some things to talk about uh, down the road. We'll stay in touch. But I do appreciate you taking the time to to come on the show with us today. Oh, it's great being with you, Jeff. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, the folks are going to find it very interesting. So we'll talk again soon. All the best to you. So what did you think of the interview with John Haber? We always like to hear from you, and you can do just exactly that through our contact page on the website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business or email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com. And as usual, if all else fails, just call us on our GBR hotline at 888-777-777. 2404. Stop what you're doing and do that right now or later or not. Now, one of the first things about John that caught my attention was the fact that early on, he knew that he could sell. He understood instinctively that not only could he effectively sell stuff, I think he really understood the importance of that skill and how it fit into the bigger picture of things. And this was interesting to me because John is also a creative guy. He's a musician. He creates music, writes songs, loves the creative process, but also knows that if you can't sell what you're doing in one way or another, you're probably at a bit of a disadvantage unless you're, you know, at the very, very top of the heap professionally. And then maybe someone else can do that for you. But that's really rare. In almost all other cases, at some point, we have to engage in some kind of sales related process to move the ball forward, even if it's just getting a job. We've got to sell somebody on hiring us. And in almost every other aspect of our professional or business activity, we have to do some kind of selling. Yet how many people do you know that profess to really dislike the idea of selling? Or they feel that they have no ability to sell. Or they lack any kind of so-called sales personality. Many think of sales in a negative way. You know, the stereotype car salesman, insurance salesman, you know, it's a long list. And this perception is often supported in the media and movies. But all that aside, what's the one critical component that will almost always give sales a good name and generate good feelings? It's service, in all caps. And that's another thing I heard John refer to more than once and in different ways. My sense is that he not only knows the connection between sales and service, he practices it and has made that an integral part of his business activities across the board. 
I think we would have to conclude that it has paid off in a major way. While there are certainly those who, by their own actions, have given sales a less than stellar connotation in some circles, I would simply refer you back to the experiment I suggested in the front of the show today, metaphorically speaking, of course. So, before we go, and in keeping with the season, I just want to take a quick opportunity to express my own personal gratitude to all of you, our GPR listeners, and all of the terrific guests we've had on the show this year. It's been an amazing experience so far, and fortunately, there's a lot more to come. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And don't forget to stay positive, stay focused on your destination, but keep all your options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on Episode 42. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com. 